It's been over 12 years since Avatar The Last Airbender ended, and not a day has gone by where I haven't thought about it in some capacity. I think about its world, I think about its themes, I think about its jokes, but most of all, I think about its characters. Over the show's three-season run, Brian Konitzko, Michael DiMartino, Aaron Ehas, and the rest of the talented writing staff created a complex cast of characters who experienced a wide range of conflicts both external and internal, setting the groundwork for incredible emotional pain. Payoffs. And while there are hundreds of lessons to be learned from this show about good writing, the one I come back to the most is how it delivers its most powerful moments. Honestly, despite it being a pretty short show, I can't think of any other series that gets my cold dead heart to feel something as often as Avatar does. So what makes the show so emotionally effective? From a general standpoint, the mere fact that it's a kid's cartoon with a comedic tilt plays a surprisingly big factor. Back in the mid-2000s when it first aired, cartoons didn't often explore the themes that make Avatar so memorable. The show examines loss, abuse, war, redemption, even industrialization, and it isn't something that most kids expected to see after finishing a two-hour block of cat dog. Its position as a show made for kids lowers the guard for anyone watching, making them more susceptible acceptable to be moved by its deep themes, and its use of comedy pushes that even further. Aside from simply just adding more entertainment to the show, Avatar's comedy works to disarm viewers. Some of the show's most emotional moments are preceded by some of its most hilarious, and the contrast between the two elevates the impact both of them have. Probably the best example of this can be seen in the episode The Desert from Book 2. It takes place just after Appa has been kidnapped by sandbenders, and the gang is stranded with no clear way out. The episode grabs grapples with Aang's grief and fear over losing his oldest companion, and there's also this pressing threat of them being trapped in a wasteland with no clear way out. It's a dark episode, but it also has this. Drink cactus juice. It'll quench ya. In this episode, Sokka provides comic relief to break up the tension of the terrible situation the team has found themselves in. It gives viewers a moment to unclench their jaws, loosen their shoulders, and take a breath, which not only helps with pacing, but it also makes it so when the next dramatic moment hits, they're not as prepared for it. The desert constantly jumps from Aang struggling to contain his grief to Sokka struggling to comprehend basic human functions, and this gets viewers off balance, so when the episode delivers its final emotional blow, it hits hard harder than if it had just been tensioned the whole time. Of course, not every story needs to be aimed at kids or contain comedy in order to be emotionally effective. That's just one way to help lower an audience's guard. While Avatar's format certainly plays a factor, there's more to it than that. Really, it's about how the show unveils vulnerability, more specifically how it unveils the vulnerability of its primary cast. The common thread between the show's most powerful moments is that characters are faced with conflicts that all but force them to respond in a way that goes against what viewers have grown to expect from them. Sometimes it's a quick moment that comes out of nowhere, and sometimes it's something that the show has been building towards for multiple seasons. Either way, when these kinds of moments come up, they work so well because characters don't respond in the way that is most natural to them, and it leads to them being at their most vulnerable. One of my favorite examples of a small moment like this happens in the finale with Sokka and Toph. Sokka's leg is broken, his weapons are gone, Toph is hanging in the air gripping onto Sokka for her life, and a group of Fire Nation soldiers have surrounded them ready to to attack. It seems hopeless, and Sokka says, I don't think Boomerang is coming back, Toph. It looks like this is the end. Tears well up in Toph's eyes as she prepares to die. What makes this land isn't that they're in a situation that seems hopeless. It's that they admit it. They understand it. And given that it is Sokka and Toph in this situation, that means a lot. Sokka, the one who has always been the relief in tense moments, who has dedicated his life to fighting the Fire Nation, who has survived countless battles despite not having the bending prowess of his companions, and Toph, the one who literally invented a new form of bending to escape a seemingly impossible situation, who has worn her pride and talent around her like armor, who has tackled every encounter head on. Both of them do something that seems unthinkable. They see death and know that there is nothing they can do except hold on a little longer. In a worse show, this would have just been a brief moment of tension before Suki came in to save the day. But instead, through one line of dialogue in a reaction shot, it stands as an incredibly powerful moment. The same idea is present in the desert when Aang enters the Avatar state. Almost every time Aang has gone into the Avatar state in the past, it has been to protect either his friends or himself. But here, he practically wills himself into it in order to get retribution against those who took Appa. 
Him using the Avatar state in this way is hard to watch. The fact that he gets to the point where he's ready to unleash his full power on the sandbenders who stole Appa shows how much pain he is in better than any tears ever could. It pushes him to not act like himself. And for a kid whose goodness seems incorruptible, this is significant. Also in this scene, we see Katara, the mom of the group who always has a speech about hope ready to go, respond with an exhausted, silent plea, knowing that there is nothing she can do except be there. This approach works because of how well Avatar establishes its characters. We learn how they typically respond to something, so when they respond differently, it's easy to notice. And this happens all the time in the second half of the series. It can be seen with Mei when she betrays Azula, abandoning her apathetic approach to life and finally taking a stand for something she cares about. It can be seen with Longshot when he utters his first and only words of the series, telling the gang to leave and that he and Smellerby will watch over Jet. It can be seen with Azula when she loses to Zuko and Katara, and any sense of the cold composure she became famous for sheds away and is replaced by uncontrolled anger and fear. It can be seen with Katara when after vowing to never bloodbend, she does it with zero hesitation when she thinks she's confronting her mother's killer. It can be seen with Zuko when he breaks down into tears for the first time since being banished, showing that the scared kid seen in the flashbacks of Zuko alone is still in there. It can be seen with Zuko when he admits that he's angry with himself for everything that's happened, after spending most of his life letting pride blind him from the truth. It can be seen with Zuko when he finally confronts his father and accepts that he doesn't need his approval, that what his father claims was a lesson was actually abuse, that he needs to make things right with the man who was a real father to him all along. Look, it can be seen with Zuko a lot. It is in these moments that the complexity of each character is laid bare. Whether the change is lasting or just momentary, we see the wider scope of who they are and who they can be. And while these moments don't come out of nowhere, they are things that at one point or another seemed like they wouldn't happen. You wouldn't expect this angry teenager to end up here, but he does. You wouldn't expect this boisterous girl to do this but she does. And you wouldn't expect this goofy kid to be brought to this, but he is. It catches viewers off guard and shows both how much a character can grow and also how much a situation can push them to become something they typically aren't. What makes a moment heartwarming or heart-wrenching isn't all that much about the incredible or tragic events themselves. It's about the way the characters we care about respond to them, how it shapes them, how it still affects them long after it happens. And look, I haven't even mentioned I imagine that Iroh has caused more viewers to cry than any other character in the show. And for good reason. He is set up as a wise, lighthearted mentor who's more concerned with Pai Shou and T than anything else. In reality, what he cares most about is Zuko. But the way he typically shows that is by trying to expose Zuko to the lighter sides of life. So in those moments when Iroh drops his calm and seemingly carefree demeanor, it is very clear that shit has gotten real. When he threatens Admiral Zhao to get him to put back the moon spirit, when he yells at Zuko to start making decisions for himself, and when he refuses to respond to his nephew after being betrayed by him, these moments have so much gravity to them because Iroh is pushed into needing to be someone different than who he wants to be. He wants to be kind, he wants to be able to rest, but he can't because the world, and maybe more importantly, Zuko, needs him. In the tales of Ba Sing Se, when Iroh sings a song for his lost son, it becomes clear that this happy-go-lucky old man is actually filled with regrets from the life he led before, his life as a general. He wishes things could have been different, and he's scared that history will repeat itself. He acts like his biggest worries are about spilt tea, but they aren't. They're about his nephew, and whether or not he'll fall victim to the same nationalistic zeal that led to his son's death. Iroh is a character who has a lot going on beneath the surface, and often uses humor and sage wisdom like a shield to protect himself from being too vulnerable. He tries to be there for other people and get them to open up, but he doesn't do it all that often. So for him to have this moment where he admits how much he wishes he could have someone speaks volumes. It defines him and puts all of his other actions into context. All of the major characters in the show have distinct personalities that are clearly defined from the moment they're introduced. But it's in these moments, where they act against our expectations for them, that we learn the most. And it's also when they feel the most human. No one goes through life without being shaken once in a while, so it should be the same for characters. Obviously, with all of the emotionally powerful moments in the show, there are many factors that make them land. Performances, musical scores, color schemes, and even the animation itself all play roles 
roles in cultivating the emotion of a scene. While not every emotional payoff in Avatar relies on characters being vulnerable in the specific way I've laid out here, it does show up a fair bit. And I think it's an approach that is important for all writers to consider, especially because a lot of stories seem to mistake shocking moments for impactful ones. The writing staff on Avatar understood that the moments that matter, the ones that stick with people most, are the ones that bring about dramatic shifts in characters, helping to illustrate just how meaningful any given situation is. And that is an example that all of us who write stories should learn from. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like what I do here and have the means to support the channel, consider checking out my Patreon. Through Patreon, you can get access to some extra content like a Q&A podcast, along with a monthly video of highlights from my wife's playthroughs of various games. On a separate note, I also stream on Twitch every Tuesday and Thursday, at least right now I do. So come hang out. Before I get going, I'd like to give a couple shout outs real quick. The first being a musician named Daokuo. A handful of the tracks used in this video were made by him, and chances are if you've watched my stuff in the past, you've probably already heard heard his music in some way. So if you enjoyed his stuff, you should go check out his work over on Bandcamp. Also, this past month, a channel named Sage's Reign has been putting out a new Avatar video pretty much every week. So if you would like more content about this wonderful show, go check out his channel. Anyway, that is all from me. I appreciate your time, and I hope you have a great day and or night, and I'll see you in the next one.